Edwin Lakarnik, thank you. Uh, fellow panelists, welcome, welcome dignitaries. I've uh, taken the permission and I'll take your permission. Let's stop the introduction because all the details are there in the brochure. So I'll just, uh, we have had an interesting pre-lunch session and also a very good lunch. So I'm sure the panelists and I will strive hard to ensure that uh, the lunch doesn't go waste. It gets digested with the discussions that we'll hold. With that small uh, beginning, uh, we, are, we have talked of what uh, we have done as a country in, the, in terms of indigenization. To us at LNT, having been part of some very important programs for the Indian Armed Forces, predominantly in the naval segment, indigenization has had many meanings over the years. The latest one being, are we creating IP in the country which can be exported? I mean, I would, uh, while the panelists are specialists and uh, real leaders in their own domain, I thought from an LNT perspective, it's important that we talk about indigenization in a slightly different context, saying that are we creating enough IP within the country which can be monetized, monetized from a national perspective because it helps us contribute to the economy in a, multi a larger multiplication, multiplier factor. A few points I thought before the panelists, uh, specialists uh, get in because they are very interesting presentations and it would be unfair of me to stand in the way. While we keep looking at the dynamic uh, intersection of cutting edge uh, technologies and the practical implementation of those which across the vast expanse of our oceans, innovation continues to be the cornerstone for us. Our maritime domain, not just from the point of view of uh, deterrence, security or otherwise, both from a point of view of uh, national importance from the trade perspective, has, a, has had a remarkable evolution thanks to the giants who have initiated, sowed the seeds and enabled us to take the, uh, take the steps forward. When we talk of divergent, uh, diverse spectrum of technologies, what comes to mind are few uh, important ones that occur to me. I'm sure the panelists would cover them in more detail. One is, of course, leveraging the digitalization and connectivity. The second is we did hear about autonomous vehicles, how we are going to, uh, go f going forward, how is it going to help us because human life continues to be very, very precious. Can we do something which can prevent loss of one human life and protect the country? So that's the second aspect that we'll talk about. Natural intelligence is very good, but then artificial intelligence at some, at some point very plays an important and complementary role because when we talk of human life where the human is not present, can something substitute at least from a decision-making point of view in a short time? The next is environmental sustainability. Most of us in the corporates who represent here, we are governed by certain ESG concerns. We can talk of material science, improvement in material science and those contributions which are needed from a completely technology perspective. But each of us, and I have very senior leaders on my uh, uh, panel, we have to answer to the specialists from environment as to what is the material we are using 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, 100 years from now, is that material going to cause harm to the planet? Now those are questions which I am sure when the discussions go on they will get touched but I thought I should touch that part because while we have made considerable progress in material science both in terms of metals as well as non-metals like composites, this is an aspect which should also bear uh, relevance. We have, of course, uh, as industries grow, all of us like to get onto the war footing in a competitive manner. But the Indian Navy, and I must acknowledge, has worked and found ways and means where we can collaborate. There are a number of examples shared in the past. And today, when we go, when we sit back and hear the panelists, I'm sure we'll find those small snippets which are not in the public domain, but where we have worked together. There are some spaces where we certainly compete. I, I don't think that should be, we should hide away from that. But where we collaborate because national objectives takes precedence over our individual businesses or corporate objectives. So with that as a background, we, we, there'll be examples of collaboration which are shared. National security, of course, that is uh, the, all, uh, the mother of all uh, important objectives and that would be the focus when we uh, speak about human capital. I did talk about how life is precious, but today with more than 15 lakh professionals in the engineering domain cutting in and comparable numbers in the other accountants, managements getting in, India is flourishing in terms of pumping out talent from the colleges, the universities, the various uh, schools. How are we going to leverage it as industry in a sustainable manner? Because anything that we do as part of the ESG, the sustainability part comes into it. 
I'm sure as the leaders speak, they would also talk of diversity, inclusivity, because today we have amongst us a large set of our lady professional colleagues, lady population who have an aspiration of their uh, own. With these few words of introduction, I'll, uh, re I'll skip the introduction, Mr. Madhu Nair, and request uh, Chairman CSL, uh, Mr. Madhu Nair, to be the opening batsman. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, respected Chair, uh, Shri Ranga, as has been brought out today morning and continuously thereafter, salutations to the <coughs> giants who have walked ahead of us, senior officials from the Indian Navy, uh, members of the industry. First of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit different about what is the flavor that was being discussed today morning. <clears throat> morning it was all about uh, how we pitch ourselves towards Atmanur Bharata, indigenization, how we, how we take that uh, leap of faith into the next levels, how we build up a very robust ecosystem and as uh, Sri Rangadhan brought out, uh, the mother of all, uh, how do you give it for the country, that kind of a flavor was being discussed. For me, uh, being in the industry, I've been with Cochin Spirit now more than 35 years. And uh, what we are seeing is like, uh, while, we, while we reach for the sky, there are a lot of things which we are definitely doing. And again, as we have uh, seen in the morning, uh, Admiral Gormade used the word that uh, this is India's time. This is young India's time, and I, I firmly believe so. So if you, are, if you are really thinking this is India's time due to a set of reasons, due to a set of uh, reasons which also includes uh, demography, which is on our side, the young Indian, India, a confident India across various spaces talking. So I wanted to present uh, what CSL is trying to do in this space and based on our experience, why we feel it's important for India to be on this, on this bandwagon. <coughs> See, while we are talking about all the, all the big things which we have done, let's also not forget that even today a fishing vessel, when it goes out, a common man's fishing vessel, if it goes out to the sea, family folk will have to pray to make sure that the vessel comes back safe. This is after 75 years of independence, this belief, despite all our IITs, all our engineering colleges, all our so-called shipyards, uh, we have not been able to break this jinx. So how do, we, how do we handle this paradox? And when the country is uh, for sure moving towards at least becoming the third largest economy in the world and the young Indian will not take anything less, how do we, how do we address this? Can we talk only about the larger things? I think we need to handle both, and, and it's, it's not always that a perfect system. So I do not come from a perfect system. But I, I'm, I'm here to show that how being, just be, being agile, aggressive, having a little bit of bravado, and having that confidence in, in yourself and in the company, in the country, we can actually do a set of things. And then we'll try to, try to connect what is really happening. And we are, we are talking about the green and the tech transition in shipping. The world is going through a transition. This is an energy transition. We call it the green transition. So colloquially, people call it decarbonization or green shipping. But essentially, we are coming out of fossil fuels and trying to do something sustainable. And this is coming from the sustainability discourse worldwide, and this is not just about maritime. It's across all walks of life. It touches every facet of the human being. And one part is emotional. We want this planet for our next generation. But the other part is pure business. This big, big business, this big industry. The second part is driven by digital. And again, this is not coming from the maritime industry. This is coming from global nature. Right from, we have, we have come to become a society which where we can leave out from our mobile phones. That, that is the kind of uh, situation we are moving into. So the digital play. So this sustainability play and the digital play together is opening up something which 
I personally feel, and again we have discussed this at long, last night too, bro, I, yesterday I was interacting with Mr. Rangadhan, the Indian Navy, we see, we have seen organization which is giving us pride, how we have come so far. But the fact is that largely everybody says India has missed the previous bus. The previous manufacturing bus is gone. Our neighboring country had taken it. We have missed it. Despite all of our advantages, we have missed it. The next bus is coming, or the next bus is here already. Do we want that bus? This is, this is what I'm just trying to look at. Can we have the next slide? Or I have a, let me see. Just touching upon, there's a large regulatory perspective, and this is all about emissions, how global regulations. Today morning, uh, Nikunj was talking about global. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are in a global world. The IMO, touching upon 2008 as a base here, the initial thought process was by 2050, whatever we were emitting, we should come down to at least 50 percentage of that by 2050. But the thought process has been forwarded, and now we are talking about, IMO has started talking about, but it's not been adopted, net zero by 2050. At least India has gone openly and said, not just in the maritime industry, 2070, this country has to be net 50. I'm not getting into the detail, but this is actually a push. This is a global push, and we can't, we can't stay away from this. And globally, what will happen is, <coughs> Today morning, the question was being asked, Greval was answering it, uh, diesel engines, will we get our own diesel engines in the country? That question came in. But on the right side, practically they're not going to be diesel for, for a lot of things. If there is diesel, you'll have to do carbon capture. Because at the end of the day, we are talking about different fuels. It could be batteries, it could be electric, could be methanol, ammonia, hydrogen. This is coming. This is the, the world's first container ship with methanol. It was launched last month by Musk. Laura Musk was launched. Musk is uh, taking another 20 container ships from Korea, all powered by methanol. So times are changing. Engineering is changing. And this transition is actually opening up big things. Into the defense side, would we see this? I bet we will see this also on the defense side. It will take it. It will be one step back, but this is this is the move that's happening. I just want to, with those two slides, I just want to say what has been our experience getting into into this segment because this is actually opening up something big uh, worldwide. Before that, I just want to say CSL as a company. Thanks, and I should acknowledge in front of this large naval crowd here that uh, we have been extremely fortunate to work with CSL, uh, to, with the Navy. Builders of the indigenous aircraft carrier Vikrant, which again I have always taken pride in, but I always believed this is not about Cochin Shipyard Limited, this is about India. This was about India. And, and that's, that's the beauty, and that is why we all cherish it so much. 14 vessels, ASWs and NGM is currently under construction, and more than a 300 refits of Indian naval projects, including 14, 15 refits of the Indian aircraft carriers. So this is what Cochin Shipyard is. So just like today morning, while it was said that Nigunj is uh, half Navy, Cochin Shipyard is also more than half uh, Navy. That's the kind of pedigree we have with the Navy. But today I'm not talking about that aspect. Today I'm talking about another aspect of ours were uh, more than a 60 vessels exported into West Europe. There's no other company in India which has been able to do this. And how we have been able to do it, have we got to the root of everything? The answer is no. But we have done this. More than 60 vessels into West Europe. More than 40 vessels already contracted into West Europe. And this is global competitiveness. I'm, I'm just wanting to bring in the confidence level and, and the aggressiveness and the fact that we can do it. We are sitting in here in India. This is not nomination. This is not, this is the, the Europeans, the people who place these orders had all the options all over the world, including our neighboring country, to place these orders. But if they have done it with us, there must be some reason and some, some overall package which we, as a company, as an Indian company, has been able to deliver. And this is a classic example. We delivered the world's first, and I repeat, the world's first autonomous Ropax vessels, which are currently in operation in Norway. 
let me come in very clearly the autonomous part was a black box for us so i do not want to lay claim on that but with that the entire engineering and deep insights into how sensorization happens we understand that these two vessels have been delivered it's currently this picture is from the port of uh, horten near oslo in norway and these two vessels are helping a company called asco which is europe's uh, norway scandinavia's uh, leading uh, grocery chain company so what they do is they carry euro containers this uh, long containers 16 of those can be transported on this in full autonomous mode right now these vessels are for one and a half years these vessels will operate under part autonomous mode and after one and a half years when the as was alluded today morning when the when the mass regulations come in fully in force this will actually be fully autonomous but the great part is during covid without seeing the shipyard two vessels were ordered and two vessels have been delivered and vessels are operating fully electric full battery operations 1860 kilowatt hour of battery powered vessel high levels of automation i skip the video project which we have concluded now and it's in the works again from india the first wind farm support vessels from india and the wind energy market again sustainability discourse the wind energy market is shooting up and these kind of vessels would be needed to support your offshore wind farms these are very costly vessels each costing more than 60 million euro each more than 500 crore rupees each vessel and again these vessels are methanol fueled vessels so the vessels will be built in uh, cochin shipyard there's a large import component the technology there's a large part of import component but the fact is i just want to reiterate that's what i said it's not a perfect case it's not a perfect system but the vessels are going to be built in india and the beauty is those engines those main engines which are main engines methanol fueled engines are going to be delivered from the main plant in aurangabad in india so it's not just the ship the engine is also the methanol fueled engine is also going to be delivered by main aurangabad again this is the world's first hydrogen fuel cell container ship the first two hydrogen fuel cell container vessels in the world Cochin Shipyard has contracted this from a company called Samskip. It's it's a Dutch Norwegian company, and uh, the fuel cell. The fuel cell is being it's it's a imported fuel cell. So we are talking about the AIP, which will go for the for our submarines. This is the direction to go. Much smaller companies with belief are trying to work in this. So. we will understand what this vessel is the complete engineering the complete detailing is being done by us the fuel cell part is a black box but i'll come to it later but these three projects we are firmly in the global green shipping circuit and this green shipping circuit is absolutely new it's old over the last 3 4 years is started so i just want to say that there was a time when india used to say let everybody do it and then after many years will come in that's not the case today the confidence level is different we are there right now and the confidence for global players to place these orders in india yet another project this is in our udupi uh, shipyard we have a subsidiary company in udupi and these are future proof vessels with the wind sails so wind assisted uh, vessels and we have uh, contracted six vessels already uh, with another 10 options to go this is uh, the largest short sea shipping company in norway many more pi orders many more projects in the pipeline we are talking about uh, again hydrogen fuel cell coastal vessels ammonia fueled and ammonia fueled there are not many vessels in the world which are ammonia fueled so when we it's it's only handful of vessels which are pilot projects so we are talking and high level of possibility that we will be on this again much more larger autonomous vessels which will go all the way from the norwegian coast up to the uk coast so these are projects which we are currently discussing and a few initiatives within shipyard and within the country today we are part of this cochin water metro project and this i say with pride because 
this is not just about Cochin Speda, I say with pride as an Indian. Because this project, when completed, 73 vessels, hybrid electric vessels in a city, is the largest in the world. So India can lead. Actually, actually, the belief is that it's not that we are doing small things. This, if something like this happens, uh, we were in uh, Copenhagen the other day. They got 14 boats. Kochi already has got 12 boats. So 14 boats in a big city like Copenhagen with rich country. We are talking 73 vessels. We are talking about replicating this with a thousand vessels all over the country. The government of India, the Ministry of Shipping is working on this. So the one belief is leading to another. The Honorable Prime Minister inaugurated this. And this is a, a classical project where public-private come together. The project is not conceived by Cochin Shpiad. So credit must go to where it has been conceived. It's been conceived by the Cochin Water Metro as an extension of the Cochin Rail Metro. And these kind of projects people are able to conceive and implement and that too like in places like Kerala which people would think would not be the best place to implement but these are things that's happening in the country we are building India's first hydrogen fuel cell vessel and when I said the initial fuel cell in that larger vessel is coming from outside this fuel cell is being made here in Pune by one of the best tech companies in India. The company is KPIT. KPIT, global major in mobility space. If, you, if you're riding a BMW or a Mercedes-Benz car, chances are that the, the mobility part of it, the automation part of it is done by KPIT. So this is a fuel cell vessel. The fuel cell has been tested last month here in Pune. It's been certified by Indian Register of Shipping, being shipped to Cochin and all going well. First of, uh, first of December, we will move this in Cochin. With Indian, entire thing is Indian. There's not a single thing in this which is imported today. Entire thing is Indian. The core technology came from CSIR. If we can do this, and this project, Cochin Shpiad is doing it, it is again bravado, let me put it, it's just bravado. That, but the people think that, why are we looking at, because when we are looking at fuel cells worldwide, small companies are trying to do this. 1.4 billion people, the kind of prowess we are talking, where is the confidence? And when we put this across, the Ministry of Shipping was kind enough to come and support 75% of the funding also on this project. But this project is becoming a reality, and uh, hopefully, I'm not saying tomorrow we'll have hydrogen fuel vessels all over the country, but this is something which we are looking at strongly. Can you just change? Electric vessels, <coughs> fully electric vessels are going to be deployed, and the first two vessels in Varanasi will be deployed by December of this year. And vessels will be deployed in Guwahati, Mathura, Ayodhya, and river cities. This is again to create visibility. And saying that when we are talking about deploying vessels, charging stations, charging infrastructure, batteries, the sad part is we are talking about big things. The marine battery is imported today. A country like India, can't we make a battery? Can't we get a type-tested marine certified battery? And today, we are talking companies like Exide, Amar Raja. Are, Exide is investing almost $800 million plant in India. So, Navy, when we are talking about electrification, as we move forward, electric propulsion, these are projects which will, which will actually trigger, trigger in, the, in the country. And it's not just Cochin Shipyard alone. Private shipyard, Chowglais. Chowglais have now secured 18 vessels from Europe. Europe needs 3,000 vessels to be replaced in the next 10 years. Coastal regulations will mean Europe will need vessels to be replaced. Chowglais bagged 18 of these vessels. And I'm happy to note from the reports two days back, and Biju is here, Mazgon Dock is getting into the line. And Mazgon Dock, I understand, is securing the orders from Europe. The more the merrier, because when we're getting into this, you know that the confidence as a country, that cycle of eco that ecosystem, today morning we were talking about why are shipyards not coming up? How will a shipyard come up? 
at the end of the day it's not about technology technology is a core part that that will be strategic but when somebody invests in a shipyard and somebody has to run a business it's all about finance and business unless we can merge these both together however the country will do whatever the navy will try to do and the navy will try to create the demand the navy has done great over the last right from right from creating the warship uh, design agency under dr paramanandan uh, way back from that time things have things have gone extremely well the kind of uh, impetus that has been put in that's extremely strong but at the end of the day this is a business people like us in cochin shipyard we always say last 35 years we were on the streets of cochin with a minus 1150 crore net worth wiped out net worth and today we are an organization with a plus 4500 crore net worth and it's only one nomination order the indigenous aircraft carrier otherwise all projects have been largely on competitive basis so if you can run your business and these are things to be done so today we are talking we are cooperating with mazgon dog we are trying to cooperate with chowglaze and as we move forward can we create brand india if we can create brand india then 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 the move we see would be entirely different small boat yard small shipyards like navalt this is a kerala based company 100% uh, solar powered vessel working over the last 3 and a half years in kerala backwaters it's won some prestigious awards internationally so so the belief in the country is actually there and the government is actually pushing we are part of the imo green voyage scenario the maritime india vision 2030 strong insights uh, not everybody has come on board cochin shipyard is trying to do our bit we are running a uh, maritime startup program called the ushas we are committed already 50 crore rupees iit madras and iim kodi kod already are working on it and it's not grant we are a commercial organization we can't do we 20% of this is grants but 60% the major part of this is by way of equity we are willing to participate along with the company work taking up to 9 percentage equity investments in the company and move forward along with it so we are there 50 crores has been committed we are ready to commit more if that is needed the country has created the first national center of excellence in green ports and shipping and i i can admit that i've been very much part of this creation of this system because at the end of the day we again needed belief we needed centers where we'll work interdisciplinary 72 crore rupees has been invested in the terry campus in gurgaon and the 72 crore rupees it's in the name of the government of india but the money has come from three ports and my organization we have put in 25 percentage of each and this is at the terry campus this contribution into the country and we are trying to create ecosystems which will further the further the green movements opportunities for india from this whole thing <coughs> in these initiatives it can actually set for a strong transition the government has already moved forward what is called the green tug transition program india the way we are growing gati shakti and our trade volumes india will need indian ports will have at least 300 to 400 tugs in the ports with the 12 government ports and ports like uh, owned by adani and dp world so these tugs will move forward special green assistance policies have been brought in by the government of india and as i said a thousand vessel urban water transport model is being contemplated so there's a clear transition plan projects pilot projects are being sought cochin shipyard is building up pilot projects with ammonia fueled coastal vessels and ammonia fueled tugs it will take some time 2027 but there are a lot of stakeholders here the designers operators partners classification societies there is also a ship builder i just wanted to touch upon today we talked about autonomous vessels and great work what sagar defense is doing we are committed our money we have our full board approvals we are developing 100% indian including the last bit of source code we are developing a autonomous vessel and we have one leading tech company in india drdo one iit and seven startup companies involved here so it's not about cochin shipyard again 
It's about how we are trying to team up, but significant money has been invested here, and we are talking about the platform. I'm not talking about the payload. Payloads can be, and we are thinking global on this, payloads could be civilian and military. But payload we'll talk later. Let's have a platform which we feel confident can be controlled and fits into global, globally emerging regulations. The opportunities for India, downline, hub for green energy, fuel cell technologies. And as I said, we are today working with KPIT in developing India's first PEM fuel cell. There are three other companies in India. There is IOC. There are at least six, seven initiatives happening in India on fuel cells and fuel cells, different type of fuel cells, different chemistries of fuel cell. Solid states, battery and solid charging technologies because with the, with the electrification which is going to happen both on road and water, electrification technologies and digital technologies because all of these are amenable to digital control at the back end. And just putting in a few few things which we feel marine batteries again again as i say shame on the country that we are not having one single type approved marine battery today we are talking there are there are companies which are just coming up show chargers propulsion motors the elderly uh, veteran asked about propeller and and we we really didn't have an answer to it you know propellers are still imported uh, hybrid technologies, power electronics, electrical equipment, fuel cell modules, and hydrogen fueling stations. I'm just, I'm just showing like a few of the things which can be picked up by industry. And this is not about a shipyard. A shipyard is definitely not going to get into any of this. So I thought I should just convey what we feel could be at the start of a new bus, which I feel this country cannot afford to miss, and together, like many other technologies, I was very, very happy to see, and my organization works very closely with VC, but what Commodore Ankur Sharma was uh, stating in the morning, and, and that final part, if you have something come to us, we'll work together, we'll talk together. That kind of a thought process, if we can drive, the next five years, we would have done much more than what we have done over the past 50 years. With this, I thank you all for a patient uh, hearing. Thanks and uh, greetings from Cochin Shpiyad. Thank you. Jai Hind. Yeah, Shri Madhuna, that was very interesting and I think people uh, have forgotten their lunch. So nice, I think. Key words that I got from your thing was, it is India's time. We have to move towards agility aggression, with your permission, I'll add the word assertiveness also. Bravado will have to be there. Global greenship, and we have an important role to play in the things to come for the globe. So it is going to be India for India and India for the world. That's how I would summarize. We have to play a part in the global regulatory, regulatory aspects also from a fuel, green fuel perspective. I think that's another aspect that he brought about. And I think one of the things that's a learning for me is how as an industry specializing in shipbuilding, he's talking of collaboration in areas which are slightly far away from shipbuilding but which bring technology to a platform level and whether how we can adapt it to other segments. Thank you very much Sri Madhunar. Dr. Sauhard Singh, I hope I got your name right, from IOC. If I have some suggestion, when can I give? Doing question answer. Presentation. Thank you, session chair. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Indian Maritime Foundation, for giving this opportunity to present here. The topic of my presentation is the strategies for the reduction of the emissions with new technologies. We also, uh, I am Dr. Sohar Singh, Chief Research Manager at Indian R&D Center, Faridabad. 
this R&D center was established in the year 1972 when there was a war happened in 1971 with the Bangladesh war was happened and the foreign nationals like Shell and BP was there for supplying the lubricant to the defense forces. At that time they, uh, they showed reluctancy to supply the lubricant. So at that time the then government of India decided to make own lubricants for the defense forces. So in 1972 Indian R&D center was set up. This uh, R&D and we have last year we have celebrated the golden jubilee of this this center and we have the the servo brand of lubricants the servo was originated from this r&d center okay. and we also represent the cimec the international council of combustion engine the cimec india is also headquartered at indian r&d center cimec is a society which is headquartered in germany which mainly works for the uh, making the framework for the big engines like marine engines or the uh, diesel engines or dg sets engines These are the agenda of my presentation, emissions, abatement technologies, future marine fuels and conclusion. And this is typically IMO regulations, like IMO regulations shows that uh, in September 2019, ISO published IMO 2020, publicly available specification for the marine fuels and this regulation possesses the significant impact on both the shipping side and also on the refinery industries. And this is a sulfur cap for the marble and excess fuel sulfur cap. Like for the earlier it was 4.5, then reduced to 0.5%. This is around 85% reduction is there. And then for the emission control area, this was 1.5% to reduce to 0.1%. And marble ratifying countries, India is a signatory for this. And there are various options are available to meet this challenging target. And these are the marble NOx limits. It started with tire 1, tire 2 and tire 3. Now in the tire 3 the, there is a reduction of NOx emissions is around 80 percent. And these are the some environmental regulations which the these exhaust emission causes like for the NOx emissions this causes acid rains. Also the SOx emissions coming from this causes the acid rains, sulfur content in the fuel. And also there is a particulate matter which is having a direct effect on the human humans locally regulated and for the CO2 emission this is a greenhouse gas, gas effect and under evaluation by IMO and there is a legislation is getting stringent both locally and the globally. And these are the what are the uh, parameters which we can control these exhaust emissions like there are the engine development drivers are there like we can increase the power density or the energy efficiency of the engines which we make and also there is a uh, fuel prices and the availability is an issue and then there is environmental regulations and emission technologies versus fuel quality is a compatibility is a key development area. And then the various abatement technologies like options for compliance are there like very low sulfur fuel oil is a one option then marine gas oil then the HSFO with exhaust gas treatment is scrubber for SOX removal and the NOx reducing devices and then the alternate fuels like natural gas, LPG, propane, LNG, methanol like my previous speaker uh, has also covered the hydrogen fuel is also there and then the economics, the fuel availability and other factors like vessels, ownership, service type, design and age and to determine the compliance method. And these are the options available. They, all the options are having own advantages and disadvantages. Like for the compliant fuels, the usual for most of the engine configurations, but there is some disadvantages. Like this is unknown fuel cost, uh, uncertain availability is there. Like LNG as a fuel is a good source of fuel, but had a good environment performance, performance, and it can reach the tire three emissions. But there is a disadvantage like high investment cost, costly to retrofit, and large variation in the LNG prices. Earlier the LNG price was around 40 million mm CMD, but recently last around two years it rose up to around 120 dollars. So there is large variation in the LNG prices, and also there is a disadvantage of methane slip in the exhaust emission, which is a greenhouse gas. Then HFO with scrubber, we can use the HFO, possible to retrofit and reduce the particulate emissions as well as the NOx SOx emissions. But there is a high investment cost and there is a fuel penalty is also there and require space for scrubber and require chemical loops for the closed loop system. And distillate fuel is uh, used for a most modern configuration but higher fuel cost may create operational issues due to the low viscosity of the fuel. And these are the compliance with emissions like if we can use the HFO with scrubber or we can easily meet tire, tire 3 NOx compliant by using SCR, EGR and water. MGO with low sulfur fuel can also meet tire 3 NOx compliant fuel by using SCR, EGR and water. 
and gas as a fuel in the emission control area and HFO is the outside emission control area, dual fuel engines and then the sulfur free fuel as fuel in emission control area and HFO in the outside emission control area, dual fuel engine. And then there are the aspects to be taken into account for the technological choice like the investment cost versus operating cost and the flexibility of technology, operational, fuel choice, installations. And this is a global demand shift, like due to the global demand shift, there is a growing demand for the very low sulfur fuel has been done and, uh, and also the scrubber demand is also in increasing. Like this is the growth in the scrubber, this is continuously increasing, this is shown. Payback economics depend upon the HSFO and the VLSFO price differential and many large companies have embarked on the multi-layer programs and scrubber installation constrained by available shipyard, dry shocks, or space in vessels. And these are typical scrubber technology, simple technology, combination with heat, weight, waste heat recovery system and our SCR. And this is a massive weight and space requirement. And these are the marine diesel emitted NOx reduction methods uh, for the control of the NOx emissions, like pre-treatment can be done like fuel denitration, alternative fuel can be used, and then the primary treatment internal measures like direct water injection, internal engine modifications, humid air motors, and the exhaust gas recirculation, and the post-treatment measures also are available like non-selective catalytic reduction and the selective catalytic reductions. And this is exhaust gas recirculation. Uh, by this method, we can achieve the NOx by cooling some exhaust gases and redirecting back to the charge air easily and process integrated with the engine increase the fuel penalty of around 4%. And then the strategies for the combustion modification like the peak temperature can be reduced like exhaust by through the exhaust gas recirculation, direct water injections, emulsified fuels or the humidified scangivane air. That, that peak combustion temperature is directly proportional, reduce the peak temperature of the flame zone and that peak combustion temperature is directly proportional to the NOx formation. If the peak temperature reduces, then the reduce the NOx formation in the engine. Yeah, these are the add-on control for the flue gas treatment, like selective cat non-catalytic reduction system, SNCR. This is having a system are capable of reducing the nitrogen oxides from 20 to 60 percent, whereas the selective catalytic reduction involves using the beds containing ammonia or urea to reduce nitrogen oxides to the molecular nitrogen and water. And this NOx reduction efficiencies ranging with the SCR as ranging from 75 to 90 percent are possible when the amount of catalyst is sufficient. And then the NOx reducer, uh, these are the nitrogen oxide are reduced into nitrogen and water vapor uh, using ammonia or urea at a suitable temperature of the surface of catalyst around 280 degree to 510 degree Celsius. This is a reliable technology for the NOx reduction, 80 percent in the diesel engines. Then uh, two-stage turbocharging. <coughs> This two-stage turbocharging is a safe bet for the future, the improved efficiency and output at lower NOx and level full load BSFC and the thermal load improved due to the increased efficiency and the brake power. Then the variable wall train like enabled by variable inlet closer or the variable exhaust closer, this is in order... This is in order to reduce the smoke during load ramps and the control the exhaust gas temperatures and optimum efficiency throughout the load range. This is without VEC, this is with VEC and then customer can run at the lowest total operation cost both inside and outside of emission control areas with less smoke emission. And this is a natural gas emission benefit as uh, marine fuel like dual fuel meets the IMO tire 3 and this is a uh, NECA compliant. And the use of the alternative fuel like LNG, LPG, methanol or ethylene in lean burn autocycle gas engines offer another means to reduce the NOx emissions and this, this can easily meet the NECA, NOx emission control area compliant. 
then this is the effectiveness of natural gas fuel versus the apartment technologies like if we use the natural gas fuel we can easily reduce the nox up to 80 to 90 percent and the SOX because basically sulfur is not available in the natural gas so sulfur is 100 percent reduction is possible similarly the pm is 100 percent reduction is possible and co2 is 20 to 25 percent reduction is possible and these are the commercially available and implemented IMO tier 3 compliant technologies like dual fuel or the LNG the, and the EGR, WTS and the SCR system. All these technologies are having their own pros and cons like the dual fuel and the LNG is a tier 3 compliant without after treatment but there is the infrastructure of the large scale availability is required and the onboard storage is an issue. Also there is a issues of the methane slip. Whereas in the EGR there is a combination with SOX after treatment, highest SOFC is there penalty versus other two tire and the bulky solution is there and then the heat exchanger falling is the issues where is SCR potentially for free NOx special operating without reasons but the bulky solution is there high complexity is there and then the some future marine fuels like uh, future marine fuel compliance options low sulfur marine fuel sulfur fuel fuels for SOx ultra low or low sulfur diesel or the low sulfur residual fuel and the biofuels like biodiesel, algae fuels, not yet available, methanol or the dimethyl ether is there. And the gaseous fuels for SOX, NOX, PM and CO2, biogas, comprised of liquefied form, natural gas or the LNG. And these are the some of the uh, advantage disadvantages of the uh, switch from the effort to distillate, LNGs and the methanol like for the uh, distillate there is an easy implementation is there but the engine modification is required and the investment is ranging from US dollar 0 0.5 to 1 million for every vessel. Whereas the LNG is cheaper than the 0.5% sulfur bunker fuel and but the investment, the engine of fuel tanks occupy more space and concerns for the safety is there and the LNG refilling facility has to be created. And the methane slip may cause a more serious greenhouse effect and for the methanol the similar advantage like LNG is a cheaper than the 0.5 sulfur fuel under most circumstances but methanol bunkering station requires low investment than the LNG. But there is an issue with the capital expenditure and the long docking period and the availability issues at all major ports. <laughs> and then the fuel flexibility for shipping like LNG, ethane, methanol, LPG. Like offshore supply vessels, drill ships, capex most important due to direct influence on the charter rate, EGR is there. LNGs are attractive at prices 20% below MGO for payback period times less than 6 years. And then the OPEX most important is HFO plus SCR plus scrubber. And LNG is attractive prices less than 1.35 times of the HFO. And LNG is a preferred technology for short haul shipping and the best option for the new builds. And HFO plus SCR plus scrubber is a preferred still a long time for ocean shipping. And investment in the fuel and the operation flexibility are the need of the hour. And this is the conclusion. There are technologies are available to meet the tier 3. And emission technology versus fuel quality compatibility is a key future development area. And both refinery based and ship based solutions coexist based on economics at various regions and operational cost, technical capability of SCR, EGR and other technologies, easy availability of LNG bunker and the bunkering safety, fuel market development impacts greatly on the TCO, evaluation and technology evaluation, overall drive is a gas, two stages and the scrubber, HFO and the NOR. Towards a cleaner world for our future generation, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Sohat. Yeah. It was very nice and uh, you talked about what are the imperatives for us yes, sir. with the concluding slide where you talked of leaving the planet better for the future. Yes, yes, sir, yes sir. So you talked about how important it is for us to reduce the emissions work towards that, right. use of alternative fuels, yes. what are the pluses and what are the minuses yep. impact. Yeah. You also talked about treatment methodology, methodologies as well as the technologies available. Yes, and in conclusion, you said how multiple fuel combinations can be used yes. so, as, so that we operate in a better way for a more greener planet. Green planet. Thank you so very Thank much. You, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, sir. My request Dr. Shekhar Murthy. Dr. Shekhar Murthy is going to take us through a very interesting uh, aspect is what uh, is a suspense being taken out before he starts his talk. On the lighter side, I have had the privilege of playing cricket with uh, Dr. Shekhar Murthy when we were studying together in Pilani. <laughs> I'm removing my mobile which is inside. Yeah, distinguished chair, eminent uh, stalwarts from the Navy and uh, those from outside. 
This presentation is about, nahi, go to the first slide please. What happened? Huh? No, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. Okay, so this is about uh, thinking ships. So I'm presuming that today we have unthinking ships and thinking persons who design, who build, who operate, who maintain, and who also retire the uh, ships after use. My only worry is that uh, if by 2050 we get thinking ships and unthinking persons, so I don't know what is going to happen to this world. Uh, I'm not saying it in jest, but I'm saying it very seriously, because um, <clears throat> when calculators came into being, I think our children have forgotten to do calculations by mental arithmetic. If you go to a grocery shop today, they do calculation with calculators. If AI comes into being and you get thinking ships, I don't know what the digital CO will do and what the digital rear admirals will do, so we have a problem in hand. Uh, we will talk about it. So that's the uh, starter. <clears throat> there is a very powerful quote. This quote is about um, if you have to keep up with the world of 2050, you, do, you have to do many things which you have seen. Many people have talked about them, new ideas, new products. But above all, we have to reinvent ourselves. Not once, again and again and again. So you cannot be the same old person and then live in 2050, it's not going to happen. So what is happening today really is that um, AI has taken our cognitive capabilities in a very large way. They can take better decisions than what we can take. Okay? We have robots which have uh, snatched away our psychomotor capabilities. They can act much faster than what we can act. And then we have um, sensors, smart sensors which can sense much better than what we do. So if we get devoid of all these aspects from human beings, you can imagine <coughs> what kind of a world we'll be in 2050. So that is something for you to think about. But if you ask me, this is going to be the story. <coughs> the story is that you cannot escape. There is no escape for you. There is no choice whether I should go for AI or not. That, is, that choice is out of question. So the thing is that we are going to be there. And whether you like it or not, sooner than later it will be at your doorsteps. So some discussion pointers for today. Revolutionary technologies, we talk, we'll talk about AI, ML, Internet of Things, 3D printing, blockchain, etc. We have how does it impact on ship design, operations, maintenance and maritime logistics. We'll see some case studies. Then we will also see some use case, cases, case studies, trends, demo of a customized chatbot, and an Alexa kind digital assistant, which I'll show you here. The, the demo of the chatbot will require me to go there. I can, what I have done, I'll tell you. Today, if you use ChatGPT3, till about 2019, all the knowledge repository that we have in the world has been captured and put there. Anything after 2019 will take some more time. Uh, I have taken a file, some uh, random file. I have taken some file related to marine safety. And I have applied the chatbot it, into it. So why it is important for the Navy and those uh, stakeholders here is that 
the navy is full of uh, navy instructions navy orders you have uh, vrs and whatever you want if you put all of those just like what i did it just takes me three lines of code to do it and if i can demo it to you you can actually virtually ask any question on that document and you'll get a ready made answer within 30 seconds so i think uh, if you have that capability with you you can imagine how you can run ships so if you permit me i will try and demo it to you <coughs> so we have a very exciting future ahead of us uh, autonomous shipping a lot has been already said so i will try to restrict myself uh, on this discussion uh, so we have this co something called maritime autonomous surface ship called mas and very important no hands on board so you can imagine i don't know what is going to happen will we have both watches or will the both watches will be attended by the robots and uh, i'm not sure okay but it is going to happen be sure of that okay then we have uh, in a large scale ai ml has impacted uh, ship design i'll show you some examples operations and maintenance and uh, Uh, we have done it in a very silo way uh, even in our navy i'm sure that much progress must be made now or must be in the pipeline so i'm sure that things will happen then how ai and blockchain impact maritime logistics so that is also one aspect which i'll try to cover so these are some things which i'll cover today so if you look at the technology and the practices to adopt uh, we have no other choice as i said but to embrace digital transformation i'm sure that none of you uh, about two decades back ever thought that you will be sleeping with a mobile next to your pillow but it has happened and you did not even know it happened and today if i ask you to keep the mobile away for about 5 hours you'll be left stranded you will feel as if something has gone out of your system so that is going to happen with digital transformation develop cyber security measures so we heard vesi talking in the morning that they are working on it we have to adapt eco friendly technologies just now we had two speakers talking about eco friendly technologies enhance connectivity and communication build competencies for and leadership in this field and this is something very important if you stick to your old training methods if you stick to your old agenda of syllabus and whatever i think will be left behind so you have to do a lot of competency building almost every day because the competencies will be changing so fast just about uh, 15 years back we never thought of uh, e marketing and today we think nothing but e marketing so you see that is the kind of change you're going to see foster uh, collaboration and partnerships again a lot has been spoken since morning emphasize data driven decision making i'll spend some time on this and cultivate a growth mindset and open mindedness if you can do all this we are ready for 2050 so in autonomous shipping we have ai ml computer vision geospatial sciences these are the technologies that are largely used smart sensors for real time data acquisition so you can see what is around you what is ahead of you and stuff like that intelligent platforms and data driven decision making so all that which comes into your uh, platform you can take very fast decisions based on what is available to you and finally uh, you can also do remote control and cloud based uh, integration with autonomous ships at sea so you can have uh, a virtual command in place probably driven by a virtual robot also so you'll have all this and none of which i'm speaking is not science fiction okay autonomous shipping uh, there have been some regulations since it's been spoken already i just wanted to give you the idea that uh, imo and uh, uh, has already addressed these issues so there is something called a regulatory scoping exercise and some orders have been issued 2017 and 2018 im orders are there
Okay, some advancements. I'll just give you a few case studies. Uh, most of the Indian case studies have been spoken since morning, so I'll speak something from what I got from literature. So we have some Falcote in 2018, Marine Insight in 2019. This is driven by Rolls-Royce, Finn Ferries. And what I'm interested here is to tell you that there has been the technology that has been used is smart sensor fusion and AI for collision avoidance and remote control. Successful autonomous navigation between these two cities has been achieved. Then we have uh, another project, uh, Maguri, Maguri, which is called Maguri 2040, and then Haynes Boone 2022. Uh, these technologies here have been drone-assisted mooring operations and an augmented reality navigation system. ORCA's AI automated situational awareness platform and powered by maritime purpose built AI and computer vision technologies. So there are some examples of which are the places and which ships have uh, ferried. So these are some examples. Then you have an LNG carrier Prism Courage, LNG Prime it is called 2022 SK Shipping and Abacus. They have their own uh, uh, software called HINAS 2.0, which is an autonomous navigation solution. It's artificial intelligence, rec recognizes the surrounding environment, such as weather and wave heights, nearby ships, then controls the vessel steering commands in real time. Okay, so again, there is uh, another example of about 1,000, 10,000 kilometers being covered with this kind of uh, an approach. So it's all happening and uh, will happen at a faster pace. Our own Indian Navy, this is the Times of India report of 24th July, and I think it was talked about in the morning. Then we have uh, how AI and ML impact ship design and operations. So there are some case studies which I picked up. One is of 2023. They developed a deep neural network DNN model to carry out initial ship hull design. And their trained model accurately predicted the ship's hull. Total resistance where the average error of all samples in the testing data set was lower than 4%. So this has been the accuracy of uh, the AI ML as applied to ship design. Just one case study I'm putting here because of paucity of time, I just uh, compressed it. Then we have this intelligent asset management. Rolls-Royce has this uh, intelligent asset management system, incorporates AI and predictive analytics to monitor and maintain ship engines. The system predicts component performance, monitor degradation patterns, and recommend maintenance actions to maximize engine efficiency and minimize breakdowns. By analyzing multiple data sources and applying algorithms, AI can provide recommendations on optimal navigation routes avoiding collisions, adjusting speeds, and optimizing fuel consumption. So all this is possible, and uh, Rolls-Royce uh, has this intelligent asset management system. Then we have something called a marine uh, pilot vision, ABB, ability. And uh, the marine pilot vision is an AI-assisted solution that enhances situational awareness for ship pilots. By integrating real-time data from various sensors, including cameras and LIDAR, the system provides a comprehensive and augmented view of ship surroundings, even in poor visibility conditions. This helps pilots make informed decisions and avoid potential hazards, contributing to safer navigation and reducing the risk of accidents. Now we move on to the AI ML as applied to supply chain logistics. So these are some areas where it is very effectively used. It is not just uh, uh, for this supply chain, it is for any supply chain in general. So logistics planning, smart warehousing, data analytics, transportation, operations, and sales and marketing, uh, you can do lead scoring. So there are a lot of things that you can apply AI and ML to, and again, most of this is already being done. Then I want to talk about uh, blockchain and uh, blockchain is also applied in a very big way in many industries. In maritime industry, it can be used in supply chain management, it can be used for cargo tracking and documentation, 
vessel registration and ownership and maritime insurance. So what it gives you is a very transparent and very trustworthy uh, immutable transactions that will happen and you can refer to them at any time and they will be 100% certified to be correct. Then we have these days a lot of buzz is going around with chat GPT and what we can do. Okay. So yes, uh, chat GPT is used in a very big way. Customer support is one. In maritime, you can use for vessel information. You can ask for various specifications of vessels and et cetera, anything that relates to the vessel. All regulatory compliances can be immediately obtained through chat GPT. Crew training can be done. Weather and port information can be available at, uh, in real time and safety and emergency procedures also can be used. <coughs> yeah, then uh, I started off by saying that I am a little frightened what will happen to human beings in 2050. Will we actually stop thinking and which will, will we actually stop moving? God knows what we'll do, but uh, uh, there are certain psychological aspects of AI. So whoever is getting into it, uh, while you cannot stop the technology takeover happening, you can address a few of these issues. One is uh, ask yourself about beneficence. That means the advancements in AI should be directed towards the benefit of society and environment. If that condition is met with your solution, you are good at it. Value-based uh, is the second aspect. Development in AI should be congruent with social values and ethical norms. And this is something which is uh, very, very important. In fact, uh, when I was growing up, my father used to say that uh, if a dog bites man, it's no news. But if a man bites dog, it is news. Today morning in a WhatsApp message I got, a very important and very uh, you know, interesting information saying that a robo has hit a human being. <laughs> now I don't, I don't know which court and which law will be applied here, but uh, tomorrow you may have robo fighting with robos, you may have robo fighting with human beings, and so, so this is very impro important, the ethical considerations and norms. Then the lucidity. AI must be transparent with no covert agenda. AI technologies and services should be subject to public audit and review. And then accountability. Since the impact of AI on society and environment will be phenomenal, it behooves upon us that the AI designers and developers to be transparent and accountable for whatever they create or manufacture. So if you apply these four principles to AI, I think we can, to some extent, control, but the technology transformation is going to happen. So now I'm going to show you some demo. So I created um, uh, something connected to Alexa, but for my own requirement. So I called it uh, thinking ships. So I put, just put some two, three questions there. It will answer only from there. If you ask Alexa normally anything, it will answer but that is from a global and public uh, repository. But here it is only customized to this. So I'll just show you one. I hope you can hear. Alexa, open thinking ships. As an AI assistant, I don't have the ability to However, I can process and respond to text-based inputs. Is there anything specific? Alexa, open thinking ships. Welcome back. What would you like to know? Um, can you tell me about the marine engineering trends? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Okay, what are what are the mari okay. what are the marine engineering trends today? Sorry, I didn't catch 
match that. Okay, I'll show you. I think it. <laughs> I'll show you another one. Alexa, open chat GPT skills. I didn't catch that. No, I, I, I think uh, is the net is not available again. Net nahi hai na? Uh, Wi-Fi is not available yet. You have? Open thinking ships. Sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> Open chat, GP. Would you like answered? Yeah, so what uh, are the environmental concerns that the marine time sector should address? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Ask me a question again, my friend. What, what are the marine engineering trends? Sorry. Uh, the, the problem. The shaker, that's for the tea break, so that yeah, this yeah, segment yeah. continues. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, you want to see the other one which I prepared for? Uh, short, of short of time. Okay. If you get time, I'll show it to you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shaker. Thank you. You know, from uh, thinking ships to thinking mobiles, we moved. The unthinking persons, of course, is there, but I just want to pose a question to the audience based on what Commander Shekhar Murthy has shared. How many of us like to hear the comment? The pilot says, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Flight AI 654. I'm working from home today. <laughs> so he's talking of a psychological impact, and I realize that the psychological impact is far, it's going to be far more uh, deeper than what we are thinking. And it was quite exciting to hear what the trends are going to be. And I think another thing that crosses my mind is with medicine, advances in medicine, most of us are going to cross the 80, 90 year age gap. And with artificial intelligence, chat, GPT and other things coming in, how are we preparing ourselves? I think we'll have to invent ourselves by the minute, if not by the day. Thank you, Commander Shekha Murthy once again. May I request Sri Biju George to please share his presentation. Session Chair, uh, distinguished uh, uh, members on and off the dais, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank the uh, IMF for uh, giving me this uh, distinct uh, honor and privilege uh, to be here this uh, afternoon and to give a very short presentation, very focused on what we are doing at MDL on the indigenization front. You can go to the next slide, please. S uh, okay. So this is already, uh, we have gone through this uh, during the day, but I'll just uh, stress on that. Uh, Post-independence, we all have been, uh, the, our forefathers uh, have been pursuing the dream of self-reliance. Uh, that is uh, obvious, and we have been uh, hearing about it about a lot this morning. And MDL, uh, as a shipyard, has been contributing uh, in an immense way to uh, for the transformation of Indian Navy from a buyer's Navy to maker's Navy. Uh, and uh, as uh, CMDCSL said, we are not half uh, Navy, we are almost full Navy. And uh, at the same time, we have built uh, 801 ships as on date since 1960. Out of that, only 28 are uh, naval platforms, remaining are commercial ships, uh, and 250 are exports. And up to 2020, uh, we had only stakeholders. Since then, we have also shareholders because we became a listed company. And uh, our uh, uh, journey has been uh, very, very exciting. As far as the indigenization is concerned, uh, this also was talked about. We come up with uh, different uh, numbers all the time. Uh, one reason for this uh, variance in numbers is how it is calculated. In fact, uh, in the morning, that question also was raised. I'll just clarify the numbers are for example, today we have most of the orders are INR orders, but embedded inside the INR orders are the FE content. So we deduct the FE content, some, uh, in our calculation we deduct the 
FE content. In some calculations, FE content is not detected. So that is why at the same time, uh, what is positive here is it's not that bad. We are on a upwardly mobile uh, trajectory as far as indigenization is concerned across the projects. And 17A is where we are today, uh, uh, where seven ships are built between uh, MDL and GRSC. And uh, this is the uh, you know, approximate gap in our ind indigenization. So the gap is the negative part, but the positive part is also there. So normally it is uh, depicted as a triad of capabilities. So I put one more uh, segment here, that is the habitability. In habitability, we are there is basically the hotel functions in a ship that is uh, send percent. Now, Atman Nirved Bharat, I am sure all of us know the initiative, but I'll uh, have a small, uh, you know, uh, rider here. We have introduced uh, something known as DPSU uh, Make One. In fact, other DPSUs are also uh, doing it. Uh, in Make One, it is uh, government funded. Make Two is a Suomoto proposal from the industry. All of us know that. But here, uh, MDL is putting funds. Uh, this morning, it was mentioned that for submarines, we have uh, put a lot of uh, uh, funds uh, up front. So this these are the four avenues we are uh, pursuing, uh, uh, mainly the first and the last. And uh, uh, the positive indigenization list, uh, there were uh, four lists that were, pu were published. And uh, out of the 2166 items that have been published, MDL, uh, MDL's list comprises of uh, 1,017 out of that. And uh, if you see the 872, which is there, which is a larger chunk here, are all uh, Russian and Ukrainian uh, spare parts. So there we have a difficult even to, we are taking time to even float the tender for that because because we do not know the specification. So it will have to be kind of reverse engineered. These are some of the challenges we face when we uh, uh, get into the indigenization bandwagon. So we uh, still we are uh, uh, working on this. So uh, RFP will be uh, soon out. This is uh, again as DPS you make one. So where maximum funding by us would be 70% and 30% should be by the industry partner. So there, uh, it, typically the model is uh, initially we develop the prototype. And the prototype has to be tested and it has to be successful. Later on, we get into commercial production. So that is also a challenge. I'll come to that. I have a slide on the challenges. That is where I would be uh, dwelling uh, uh, more. So these are some of the things which we have indigenized. These are uh, small things. See, uh, if you look from a shipyard perspective, See, we are not an equipment OEM. We are primary a sh ship builder. We are an integrator. But uh, we also would like to play a facilitating role for indigenization of the system. So with industry partners, uh, we have uh, joined hands and uh, facilitated or in sometimes funded. Uh, so this is how, these are some of the systems which is already developed. I don't have time to dwell on each of those things. This gives a uh, picture in broad strokes which is already done. So, um, under indigenization, uh, there are uh, certain uh, big ticket items. You can see the electrical propulsion motor. We have already placed an order for uh, uh, for uh, the total value would be around 163 crores. So. These three, the three, four, five, uh, is a good example where we can't take off in indigenization. So I just, for the information of this forum, see, as I said, we are a listed company. Uh, the fundamental difference between a government department and a company is, a government department works with budget. We work with the cardinal, uh, you know, bedrock principle of profitability. So a business case has to emerge for investing. So that is, and we are accountable to the, not only to the stakeholders, to the shareholders as well. So these three didn't have a positive business case. So the board rejected those cases. So we are looking through alternative channels to pursue indigenization. Um, so we have also uh, uploaded the details of difficult items. There are in many cases, no, there is no partners coming forward for indigenization. Because uh, I'll come to that why it is so. And uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, arranged a lot of avenues uh, soliciting partners for indigenization. So funding, as I said, uh, uh, this is like DPSU make one. Uh, DPSU make one, uh, uh, the, the DPSU plays the role of government of India. Like government of India is funding, uh, it's going from a fund. It will, it will be christened as the R&D project, which there is a mandate to spend a particular percentage of uh, our pat on R&D. Now, these are the challenges in indigenization. Uh, 
See, the nature of the uh, shipbuilding industry, especially warship industry, is a high-value, low-volume business. So uh, if someone has to come forward to invest heavily, there should be adequate business volume. So in many cases, the business uh, case is very weak. So we are unable to take it forward. So uh, the second aspect is, we as a shipyard is unable to assure any business. Many companies came forward as we can partner with MDL. Tell me after prototype development, how many firm orders would you place? So we asked the Navy how many orders can be placed. So Navy replied telling that, uh, see, we can't assure the order because we do not know how many AONs will be, uh, will be uh, approved by the government of India. So you have a, a kind of uh, cyclical uh, problem here or a chicken and egg question here. And that is actually becoming an impediment for uh, pursuing indigenization in a big way. As I said, uh, the three cases were uh, this, the lack of positive business case. So we had, uh, we are not shelved it, but we are this. Secondly, the expectation of success in the first place in R&D projects. The Edison's first bulb, we expected to glow. So that's our uh, Indian mindset. So we cannot spend, otherwise it's, it's termed as, you know, we have uh, 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 no, the sunk the fund. So this expectation in R&D project, especially when uh, government companies take up, this is the, another challenge. Then IPR is also becoming an issue. When we are uh, together funding, of course, there are co-owning of IPRs, etc. But when it comes to, one is the cost sharing in the prototype development phase. Then the next phase is, of course, the profit sharing. So this sometimes can become uh, slightly vexing, uh, sharing of cost and sharing of uh, profits. So uh, indigenization, uh, sorry for the spelling mistake there. Uh, indigenization has to be seen as a national capability development. So that is something which uh, at the government level, we are also pursuing the uh, uh, department uh, to look at this. And therefore, a uh, uh, corpus of fund has to be earmarked for this. S uh, and budgeting should be by the government of India. As I said, budget and profitability are two uh, completely polar uh, opposite uh, concept. And TDF, for example, is now limited to 50 crores per project if this can be enhanced. In fact, all the three projects we can pursue through the TDF route if this was there. So these are the, uh, there is a technology development fund. So for big ticket items, this could be used. Now these are, uh, uh, look small suggestions, but it can uh, radically transform the way in which uh, a company or a shipyard when they pursue indigenization in partnership with vendors, where there will be a true a positive business case, there it will be a business, uh, attractive business proposition. So that's all that I wanted to share. Uh, I've been very brief uh, uh, because uh, time is also short. Thank you very much for your patient attention. Thank you, Mr. Bijuja, that has crisp and the efforts at indigenization that MDL is taking, you could articulate. You also brought out the challenges given the compulsions of running a corporate uh, in the opposition. Uh, of course, uh, the positive uh, indigenization list is helping and you are taking care, I mean, you are leveraging the ecosystem. The business cases, as they emerge, hopefully we should be able to overcome the challenges. I think one suggestion that I take away is, can we enhance the TDF in a manner which is making a decision making radically different than the constraints that we face? Thank you very much once again. I'll request Mr. Kostub Falnikar to start his talk. Sure, sure. You have all the time, but you have to ensure that people get hot tea and not cold tea, that's all. Yeah, you just press S5, that should work. Good afternoon and uh, sorry for that delay. Uh, thank you, Session Chair, and thank you, IMF, for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk to such a distinguished audience. I'll not take too much of your time. Uh, what I wanted to share was some of the work uh, that we have been doing in the area of mine countermeasures using USB. And uh, typically when you think of uh, private industry, you know, you may think that ah, they are flush with funds, so what's the issue? But actually the reality is when you look at R&D, every R&D person has to justify every rupee uh, that he asks, he or she asks from the management. So when we embarked on this uh, project, what we thought is let's develop the core technologies that are required for MCM using USB. 
and then we can make it scalable. So when we actually embark on the final product, we already have the backbone built in and should be easy to scale up. Um, yeah, can you go to the next one? Achha, idhar karu. Ah, yeah. So what I have there is a very uh, short uh, product video. It shows all the different uh, autonomous vehicles that LNT has been already building. And then just a short introduction of what we call as the Vega. Uh, this is a very small platform, 4.3 meter length. And uh, it's completely autonomous. So we have been developing this over the past three years. And uh, what we have done is fitted it with a navigation radar and obstacle avoidance radar. It's got uh, simple uh, payload cameras. We didn't have a proper site to put on it right now because you don't need it. You just prove your technologies and then scale it up. And then for MCM, what we did was we fitted it with a very basic side scan sonar, put some dummy mines in a lake and did some imaging. And that's how we uh, developed the backbone of MCM using USBs. So I put down some of the basic specs. It's a very simple boat. And you can see the picture over there, powered by a 75 horsepower uh, outboard engine. And of course, we've developed this in collaboration with Indian Register of Shipping. They are helping us with the class requirements for this. So typically, when you talk of an MCM uh, process, you're looking at these steps. Uh, you have to detect the presence of the object, which you do uh, actually with a multi-aperture sonar or a synthetic aperture sonar. In our case, we have done it with a side scan sonar, because the moment you talk about an MS or a SAS, you're talking about few crores of rupees. Uh, then once you have detected, you do a classification. So you can have either a man in the loop, or in this case, you will have some algorithms running, which will tell you that, yes, this is something which is an MLO, a mine-like object, something which is of interest. Then you do your localization. So you need a geo tag on it. So that later on, obviously, you don't just want to detect the mine, but you want to go in with your ROV and actually intervene with it, positively identify it, and then take it out. So that's the next two steps, which is identification, which is typically done with the ROV, and then the neutralization. And in these two steps, we anticipate a man in the loop, because uh, this involves a final confirmation and putting a small explosive charge, which you can remotely uh, detonate. Yeah. So uh, this gives you a glimpse of uh, the basic user interface that we have on our prototype system. And wherein uh, the user on the right hand side, if you see over here, you can basically specify what are the borders wherein you want to operate in this zone. So that's the zone which the MCM officer has designated. And then you define, uh, you know, these are the waypoints which I want to go, th go in. So this is a GPS based uh, uh, waypoint navigation system. And then you can basically uh, do all your mission planning. Uh, you can set the speed at which you want to do your scan and so on, all the parameters of the sonar, et cetera, just to give you a glimpse. And then, uh, of course, uh, you can't just go in and do your MCM. You need to develop some basic technologies before that. So what we did was we embarked on a, a small team which was working uh, exclusively on obstacle avoidance. And here we have two radars on the system. So one is, of course, a long-range navigation radar, a 3G radar. And then we have a very small uh, close-range obstacle avoidance radar, which can be used for emergency stops. And uh, this actually shows you some pictures of the obstacle avoidance trials. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the support we received from the Indian Navy and especially from the authorities at INS Shivaji, who allowed us to use the lake uh, uh, in Lonaula and also helped us with a lot of uh, logistic and uh, informational support. So what you see over here is basically these uh, small dots define the waypoints which are already programmed for the USV. And uh, we have deliberately put some targets over here, which you can see as a couple of buoys. And those buoys have some uh, aluminum foil wrapped on them so that the radar signature is better. And then once the USV encounters, uh, when, once it sees those obstacles, it automatically generates a path which is avoiding those obstacles. And once it's done that, it reverts back to its original mission. So obviously, it doesn't go back to its original waypoint, but it goes to the next waypoint. So these are some of the technologies uh, which we started working on in the obstacle avoidance domain. And that's just a basic flowchart to show you how those corrections are applied. And then, of course, you need a long-range data link. Because think about this. Uh, the USV, 
uh, has to be at a significant distance from the mothership or from the shore if you are operating in your harbors so that you are actually getting an advantage of using an usb right so uh, what we did was uh, we had some facility near uh, uh, just uh, at the southern end of gujarat where uh, we had the ability to do a long range testing so we fitted a long range data link on the usb so on the usb we had four antennas and on the ground station we had a couple of them and the ground station was just at 12 meters altitude so not a very significant altitude if you put this on the mothership you will get much more height than this and uh, uh, we had two cameras which were feeding uh, to the data link and we also were capturing the uh, gps and the ins data so that the roll and the pitch of the usb is also captured so we required about 4 mbps for our uh, data to work properly and we were able to prove this up to 10 kilometers so beyond 10 kilometers uh, we started losing a lot of the data and of course if you have a, a much higher uh, antenna on the ground station you can go much beyond 13 even 20 kilometers so that was one more step in uh, basically getting this technology to work and then we embarked on our lake trials so what we did was a very basic side scan sonar mounted it uh, directly to the boat so it's not a good way to do it you know uh, a better way would be to tow it because any roll and pitch of the boat is transferred directly to the sonar also uh, since the uh, depth of the sonar is very less you're going to get a lot of reflections you're also operating in very shallow waters so it's very noisy uh, but that's what you need when you're developing something because if i get a very clean signal very nice images uh, that's not going to help me when i'm in bad uh, waters right and then uh, this again uh, we would like to acknowledge the support of the navy so this is where we launched the usb from and we defined four waypoints put two targets in there the targets were just uh, drums uh, suspended and uh, they had a buoy on top because at that point we didn't have dummy mines and then uh, this is what the picture looks like so we were able to identify uh, so this is target number 2 target number 1 and this is the actual uh, waypoint which or, or the actual path which the usb is taking and you can clearly see you can identify a target if you have a better multi aperture sonar you can get a very mo much more crisp and very nice uh, uh, resolution image on which you can do ml subsequently uh, then next we progress to our own uh, facility at chennai near chennai at katupalli where we have a shipyard and we have access to a waterfront so we created a couple of dummy mines uh, one to uh, uh, you know simulate a mood mine and one to simulate a anti landing dummy which is at the uh, bottom of the sea bed and uh, we did some imaging with that so here you can see the image of a mood mine you can see the reflection here again it's not very clear because you're very close to the surface it shows 16 but the actual image uh, over here was taken when we were only at about 5 meters away from the mine so lot of reflections and there's a jetty right next to it and this is the image of the anti landing dummy so uh, this helped us to get some basic data okay how does a mine image look on a sonar what are the challenges in operating such a system with a usb what what is the kind of interface that the operator would need what is the kind of data link requirements and so on and then uh, we had a group working also on the uh, ml part of it so uh, i am sure you have heard a lot of ml and ai today so you are all already experts in this you basically start with a data set you label it so what i have shown here is in a python system you are basically labeling the data you know you get images and you tell the system you teach the system that this is a mine this is something which is not of interest or of interest and so on and then you validate it you keep running uh, different different images as much data as you can get and then finally implement it to check the accuracy so this this actually shows you the probability with which uh, the system is detecting it's detecting that it's a ship with about 80% accuracy and this is a mine with about uh, 0.78 78% accuracy uh, these two images are sourced from the internet because the data set that we have is again taken from the internet so these two images are not taken from our system and then finally to wrap up uh, what is the way ahead you know where do we go from this so uh, first is the usb and rov integration so now we have the basic blocks where you have a usb completely unmanned and uh, you have ability to detect the mine now uh, we need the ability to integrate a rov and remotely from the ground station or from the ship mother ship uh, uh, have the rov actually go confirm the presence of the mine and then take it out 
uh, we are also interested in USV AUV teaming. So we have our own Amog, which is a 1,000 meter depth capable AUV already in the water. So if you team both of them up uh, with underwater communication, then you can further extend the reach. Okay? So if you are operating at significant depths, you want to detect a mine at, say, 100 meter depth, then this is an easier way of doing it rather than towing uh, sonar all the way down there. And then uh, integration of a synthetic aperture sonar. So once we showed this to our management, I was able to get some funding for a synthetic aperture sonar. So that would be the next step to integrate it. And then refining of the MLO data set with support from the IN. So this is where I would request some support from the relevant agencies of the Navy. Uh, all the agencies who are working in uh, mine countermeasures, you have the data, we don't have the data. So if we can figure out a way of working together, uh, we can actually make a genuine 100% indigenous system for the Indian Navy. The only thing imported in this system today is the sonar sensor because we don't make it in India. Everything else, all the intelligence, everything is 100% Indian. So with that, I come to the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Shri Kostu Falnika. You talked about uh, mind countermeasure. I think in the wars, that the war theater, this is going to play an important role, especially thinking of human lives and saving of human lives and assets of the country. The core technologies you said are scalable. Hopefully, we should see some examples of that in collaboration with Navy when you get the data. You talked about uh, uh, preparing for uh, creating the model under severe test conditions so that under more benign conditions it will be uh, easy to detect and work upon. You also talked of how integration of USB with ROV will bring about far more uh, resilience and intelligence uh, intelligence inputs to the Navy to take uh, considered decisions. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, Admiral Nadaf, you wanted to share something, so you get the first chance to speak. Uh, this is for the shipyards, actually. I'm sure you are aware about the latest uh, requirements of the net uh, uh, carbon zero. Uh, the government of India has committed that by 2070 we will be a net carbon zero and by 2050 about 50 percent. <coughs> so in this direction there is a lot of work is going on and uh, one of the major contributor would be uh, uh, the nuclear power plants. Now, among the nuclear power plants, which are larger in size, say 220 megawatts, 540 megawatts, 700 megawatts, 1,000, and 1,650, these are on the anvil. And they are going to contribute significantly. Uh, by 2070, we will be needing something about 870 uh, gigawatts of power. And, uh, and we will have to reduce the coal-fired thermal power station by 50% uh, or more uh, because they are the biggest carbon emitters. And for the uh, replacement of the old uh, uh, thermal power stations, uh, coal-fired or even the uh, other fuel-fired, uh, there is a strong move for bringing in SMRs, that is small modular re reactors. Now these are in the zone of something like micro reactors which are in the zone of 5 to 10 uh, megawatts of power <coughs> or say around 100 megawatts primarily and then up to about 300 megawatts. So there is a lot of research work is going on and uh, uh, users would be uh, one is thermal power station replacement because they are the biggest generators of the uh, carbon and to replace that with the uh, uh, nuclear power plants will reduce considerably the carbon emission. Uh, the other users are big industries, remote power stations where the power big uh, grid is not available like Andaman, Nicobar, etc., Leh, etc. But the other bigger users are the shipping industry because there are a large number of ships, there are large number of power plants on board mostly a diesel driven or uh, fossil fuel driven. So uh, there is a great amount of work which is going on. Uh, you must be aware, if you are aware uh, very well, but uh, people are now considering uh, very seriously use of nuclear power plants, 20 megawatts, 30 megawatts, up to 100 megawatts for bigger ships. And uh, <coughs> 
So India is also considering these things and uh, therefore uh, we uh, are trying to design these uh, small modular reactors in which the requirements from the various industries coming up. You know, like um, uh, fertilizer power plants, or uh, fertilizer uh, yeah, industry, steel power plants. Uh, uh, so these kind of industries are coming up saying that we want 10 plants, 15 plants, 20 plants. So if you are in a mood to uh, get these nuclear power plants on board, then there are people who are working and you should be in touch with them. Like Canada is working on it. Uh, South Korea is working out on it. India, of course, is working on a submarine plants, but they, this can be modified for shipboard applications. So keep this in mind. That is what my suggestion is. Thank you. Oh, so thanks for that uh, information. <coughs> in fact, the SMRs and the way uh, it's getting developed, at least in the 100 to 300 megawatt range, uh, this is definitely going to be one of the greenest solutions and whatever we are talking into the future, the net zero will be largely driven by SMRs. Uh, we are aware that at least in shipping, people have started to talk about this. But on the same tone, uh, we have heard another, another discussion because uh, now we are talking about geopolitics and we are talking about do you want to put an SMR on a mobile platform Land is perfectly fine where you have control, but do you want to put this on a on a platform? Strategic platforms where your country controls it is one thing, so that's for sure, but a private platform, let's put it that way, which can go to hands which are not desired. So this would be because we have been, at least Canada has reached out to us, uh, to have, have this discussion, but then uh, we thought it was a little bit too early. We'll keep a watch on the technology side and how it's emerging. But other things, uh, we, we heard this contrarian view on a portable platform, especially what we are seeing elsewhere. Thank you, sir. Yeah, few questions, please. Uh, I, hope, I don't know how much time we have till the next session is. We are eating into the next session. But yeah, Dr. Rana. Yeah, uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I have a small question. Uh, first of all, an observation. Uh, see, it is important. Uh, I mean, the personalities I feel make a difference. If you are in the chair, you can take a decision. You know, and whatever may be the processes and procedures, you can make a difference. Uh, and before I proceed further, I'd like to uh, apologize if I offend offend anybody on the panel. My question, direct question, is to MDL. You know, have you uh, have you done an introspection? Because you in, the, in the, your presentation you have mentioned about the challenges you face, and you are not able to uh, 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 you know spend the funds, etc. What is that exactly is the reason? You know, the industry is coming forward to you, the academia is coming forward to you, and uh, whenever you have a challenge coming uh, or a dictat coming from the government. Uh, then you spread the word, you know, you want so-and-so, uh, so-and-so solution. People work around it and put the solution to you and then everything is quiet. It is important to have a conviction within the organization. I mean, uh, within the organization. And if you as an individualist are convinced to do something, you will find ways to do it. I mean, the sprint is an example. I don't have to uh, say so. So it is important. Because you, uh, because you know, academy, you work, uh, take a proposal from an academia. He works hard to put up a proposal. Then you have multiple number of discussions on that, and then all of a sudden you become quiet because the defense secretary has changed. His uh, focus earlier was artificial intelligence. The previous defense secretary's uh, focus was R and D. What is your focus as a, as an organization and as an individual? And as a part of that, you are expected to spend 2% in any case. And now even that limit is over. So I think you need to do a lot of introspection. I mean, uh, uh, Mr. Piju George uh, knows. He has himself worked hard on the problem statement. We have worked hard on the proposals being made. Nothing emerged. Then one fine day, you know, your director submarine calls me, sir, I sir, AI ke proposal I said, come on, have a joke. I mean, he was my deputy, so it's fine. So I ran around and got almost 15 people 
moved around my various networks in the academia, in the industry, put up the proposal, till date one year, zero output. You would you like to comment on that? Uh, I'm sorry to be a bit harsh, but we have been since morning saying, you know, we are successful in so and so, so and so, so and so. But what are the reasons for not being so successful? Because we have the money. What is it that is uh, missing from our, uh, 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 from, from us that we are not able to deliver that much as what we are capable of delivering? Yeah, we have the money, but we cannot spend it uh, just like that. If it was my personal company, all of these projects have uh, no, commissioned uh, uh, in one hour. But the issue is, uh, there has to be, as I said, a business case has to emerge. And uh, what is the return on investment has to come. Then only uh, uh, the finance will clear it. Then only the board will clear it. So, not that all, all has been uh, uh, no failures. There have been success stories also. So certain things it has gone ahead, uh, and I've already shown uh, some of the things which has been indigenized. Uh, MDL has taken initiative now for uh, submarine electric propulsion motor. Uh, we have uh, uh, embarked on a very uh, it's a big ticket item around 165 crores. So not that uh, so so certain things are you know uh, there is a motor. In that particular proposal, what we are telling is that uh, you see sometimes there is no tangible deliverable in the sense where you can point out a. This thing. So that these are the mindset issues. I fully agree with that. So these are the uh, issues which are there. Uh, so in some cases it has not taken off. Doesn't mean that every case has been uh, uh, has been on the, of the on the same uh, uh, category. So we have we have uh, made attempts. So although we have uh, earmarked certain percentage for R and D. So for example, three artificial intelligence products. We have embarked into a success story in uh, with uh, collaboration with IIT Chennai. So that is taken off and uh, it is uh, reaping uh, dividends, that is AI projects. This particular project where we had you know, uh, personally got involved didn't take off. Uh, so for whatever reasons, uh, this is not the forum where I, want, I don't want to get into the you know, nitty gritties of that. So uh, I would not agree with a blanket statement that nothing moves there. A lot of things are moving there. But there are cases where it has not moved also. Uh, that's what I would have said. So that uh, holistically when some uh, the board sees or uh, if the finance sees, uh, it's a different uh, uh, take altogether. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vijay Shah. Sir, one uh, sure. bit of information and one question thereafter. Uh, the information is that uh, some of you might be aware and for those who are not aware, especially because MCM and things were being discussed, uh, the ITEX for 4G. Uh, which was launched in last uh, Aero India, but it hasn't made much headway. As I mentioned in the morning, uh, the Navy has filed 55 patents. 12 of them, which are primarily dual-use technology, medical patents and things of that kind, have been transferred to the industry. But the specific uh, naval use ones, five of them have been launched in Swavalambhan. Details will be put out in the public domain shortly. Uh, but they include uh, underwater mine uh, sweeping system and underwater mine containment system. Uh, both of them are uh, patents filed by uh, Lieutenant Commander Mayank Sharma. And the details, we would be looking at industry partners to, you know, uh, we filed the patent, we have the idea, but to manufacture it at scale and give it to the Navy is something which will be done through the IDEX of 4G uh, scheme. Uh, that was for information of the industry and anybody else also who might be interested in this. The details would be coming out uh, uh, soon when the interaction starts. My question is uh, about what you mentioned about uh, DDF, uh, uh, the need to enhance the limits. Uh, I think uh, if the limit used to be 10 crores and it was increased to 50 crores, and if we do an uh, audit, how effective has it made the scheme? And if we find that it has not really made it, then maybe the problem is somewhere else <coughs> because of which uh, it is not effective, if it is not effective. So uh, raising it from uh, 10 crores to 50 crores if it has not given returns, uh, do we really feel that making it 100 crores will give you returns? Or is it that the problem is elsewhere and not in the money? That's the question. Yeah, we were, uh, in this particular case, we were ready to, uh, you know, we had uh, floated the tender, we had the uh, so-called price discovery, etc. But then the business case was not emerging because we do not know how many uh, such, uh, for commercial production, only then the business case will emerge. So then we wrote to TDF, TDF told that uh, this is uh, uh, more than 50 crores, so we can't fund it, so that because of the cap. So if uh, if it was say for example some 65 crores was the limit, then this project would have uh, we, we would have placed the PSO. So that is the 
that is the case I mentioned. Thank you. We'll take just two more questions. In, in fact, this was for the propulsion, uh, uh, propeller and uh, on the shafting. For this is a CPP for a P-17 class of ships. Thank you, Shri Vijay. We'll just take two more questions, please. Thank you. Between IDEX uh, project and the TDF uh, project. So, uh, TDF is primarily for uh, developing the technologies. Uh, I think it's not for a product. A product can have about 10 to 15 uh, technologies. So if you're funding for each technology, 10 crores or actually 50 crore, uh, the integration of the product can be done under a different scheme. Uh, so like I've seen even in the, even the TDF, uh, we tend to discuss about the products. Technology product are two distinct areas. Thank you, Mr. Srinivas. One more question. I think there was a gentleman. Yes. Sir, Commander Harshit Rate. I was going to ask a question in the last session, but uh, luckily uh, it's relevant right now also. My question is uh, to Sri Biju George, uh, the director, MDL. Uh, sir, this is with respect to uh, standardization. You have delivered a lot of products. In your uh, uh, presentation, sir, you said that MDL is the assembler and uh, you are not actually contributing towards indigenization. So I, it's actually thrown me off my balance because uh, you, uh, with a small example, sir, I'm just sharing to this August gathering. Uh, gathering. Uh, I'm st speaking of only one class of ships, that is the Kolkata class, which you have uh, very recently handed it over to us. They have a range of around 44 walls and a scale of over 400, 400 walls fitted in the system. And uh, I, I'm very disappointed, I'm a naval docket manager system, sir. And uh, we had two ships which are having one type of wall, and that is Kochi and uh, uh, Kolkata having one type of wall and suddenly we've just finished uh, Chennai EMP which is having a completely different set of walls. You have thrown the inventory management of the Indian Navy out of the loop and uh, we are presently struggling for spares. So I just wanted to request you sir, how are we ke keeping a check on stand something basic standardization of walls sir? Which is a completely offloaded thing or a subcontracted thing by the MDL to another vendor against specifications which are given by the Indian Navy? Yeah, this is a very loaded question. It will take some time. So I am really happy that uh, the shortest pre presentation is, uh, you know, inviting maximum number of questions. <laughs> so, so if I had given a longer presentation, probably we, do, we wouldn't be able to discuss. So, yeah, sorry? Lesser questions. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'll give short answers to this. See, no, 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 no. There, see, the, the, I am focusing only on indigenization. I am just on, on to the to the point, which is the subject that was given to me. So, valves uh, is a small word for a big subject. <laughs> so, uh, valves is a category. Uh, you know, C C procurement. If you are aware of the A, B, C star, and C. So uh, maybe C star. So where shipyard vendors we can place. So uh, Navy has given the liberty to us, and there is an import embargo. We cannot go abroad and import the valves. So we go to the vendors who are available in the country. P17. I'll give. Uh, give uh, I'll take only a minute. There are 15,000 valves orders were placed on eight vendors for let us say 10 crore rupees, this is not the exact amount, just to see the order of magnitude. All of them were delinquent, not even one valve came from these eight vendors. We had to, through a separate tendering process, unprecedented in the history of uh, shipbuilding, when orders are already alive, you cannot uh, uh, normally cancel it. Others you have to invoke risk purchase. We went ahead and tendered and for 50 crores, we ordered the same amount of valves. They are also partially delinquent. So there are three vendors. I'm not here to name the vendors, or it's, uh, it may not be there. Because type testing requirements are there. The, 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 uh, the plethora of uh, testing and the procedures which has to go for finally the product to deliver, it's uh, humongous. 
Second involves, I'll tell you, uh, it may be a information because we are deeply involved in this. Involves the problem is if an MSME vendor takes a wall, he's having a big problem. Initially, you have to buy the raw material, he'll not get any money. He has to cost, no money. He has to type test, no money. Only after tested product is given, he will get at least some money. So, up to that time, his funds are blocked. Yeah. For, no, see, in foreigner it is, foreigner it is LOC. I say, sorry, line of, uh, yeah. So this is how it is, uh, actually it is there, that is the thing. So the, the ecosystem as far as ancillary industry is concerned for this kind of uh, you know complexity which is involved let me tell you how, especially of valves can i just yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. Yeah, you see this is the problem of wish list the industry would like to have a, a good favorable payment terms and conditions they would like that because they want to deliver that but the government in India doesn't do that. You see the nuclear industry, we are suffering from that. Today's delivery condition, earlier it was stage-wise payments. That means if you done the design and submit the drawings, you get money. You have uh, ordered the material, you get the money. And things like that. Today, you don't get advance. Maximum if you beg and borrow, etc., then 10%. 90% money is given only on delivery. This is a hard fact. And it is a prominent industry. It is the, the nuclear industry is a prominent, important industry. Uh, close to the government. It is the PMO's office who is, uh, you know, uh, lead, dealing with this. So, what is the wish list? They would like to deliver. We would like to deliver. But the fact is that these are not the payment terms and payments. So there is no point in debating on this. Yeah. Yeah. Admiral, only you and then we close the session. Thank you. First of all, Tarate, Commander Tarate rang a bell. When I was DGM Engineering Naval Dockyard, Commander Subra K. Subramanian CMD, ex CMD, was my MCS. And when I went to the MCS, all sort of thing where Lieutenant Commander Hardy was tearing his hair and beard. Okay. Gentlemen, if one of the hard wall fails, hard failure, man dies. Walls and pumps are the most important thing in a system, in a ship, which has not got due attention. Okay. Now, in the since I was in classified program also, we had a system. Only thing which is possible was a large number of walls and various dimensions from 25 mm to 150 mm, various categories HP, LP, air, water, sea water, fresh water, everything. So you have got a massive amount of money involved, and it is always possible that a couple of syndicates are formed outside by contractors and they take all these things. It is very essential, number one to have a technical assessment of actual vendors and you have to go to government and tell them that you need to have a different paying contractual conditions. You need to give for raw material, you need to give for testing, you have stage payments, that's how the program did. You have to have these things. At the end of it, you made good ships. What is the problem? But the ship is non-operative because walls are there and the Manager is struggling. 
you need to look into this paint terms, you need to look at the contractual terms for walls and similar things. Sir, payment terms, uh, we can probably do it once. After giving those payment terms, if the, it doesn't deliver, it becomes an audit objection and it becomes a precedent. You have so, a problem, no? You have a problem. That's what? The ship, so, the ship so gets tied alongside. So once it can be not working. So if it fails, then uh, uh, we will come under a heavy audit objection. Yeah. This uh, stage payment, etc., is part of the negotiations. You cannot just say that I place an order for 50 crores and uh, this is it. If is going to stage payment, then the cost will approximately again be readjusted. So it's a question of the quantum of order and at what stage, what is the terms of payment because if it's a small scale industry, MSME, he may need some money so he should ask for it. You cannot just, uh, not one way traffic. The procedures are very well clear. It is just that you have to have a, a in the negotiation stage, you just decide what you want to do, both the vendor and the uh, uh, customer. So it's just uh, not one way traffic. Thank you, Admiral, and thank you, fellow panelists, for uh, wonderful uh, discussions and presentations. I think the questions were focused, and the other panelists we escaped, and the moderator escaped too. <laughs> That's. But what emerged, I think, I'll just take a couple of minutes to conclude, what emerged from the talks, whether we talked of creating Indian IP or whether we talked of uh, Indian indigenization in a broader sense, it talked of a resurgent India. It talked of an India being more than ready. It talked of the, what emerged it is India, how it is future positioned and future proofing. The demographic advantage, the technological impact due to AI and ML, including the uh, many of us flying without uh, the pilot working from home. I think one other nuance which dr drifted through, and I don't know if all of us caught it, I thought is when the objective becomes a larger national focus item, as defined, national capability development, then the uh, the options that emerge for collaboration are multifold. Scalability, sustainability are very important from a future, when we talk of future proofing because material science progress also needs to keep pace with the AI, otherwise AI will be far ahead and we will be struggling with the basic material science. Uh, Admiral Nadav did bring about uh, nuclear reactors, of course, uh, Chairman um, Koshin Shipyard talked about, he didn't mention the word piracy, but I think somewhere he had that in his mind when he talked of what could be a geopolitical situation. Uh, from uh, Commander Shekhar Murthy's uh, AI, uh, the only thing I'm uh, I'm taking away from this session after hearing all the speakers is their speeches have been they have been very aspirational in what they went. That's the first A, and this talk has been very inspirational. So with that, I conclude this session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anganathan, and uh, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I think this has been a very lively session, and uh, as was evident, I think the Q&A session was, uh, you know, also very interactive and generated a lot of uh, debate and discussion. Uh, as you can notice, uh, we are already about, about an hour behind time. So, without further ado, may I request the President IMF to present the mementos. Uh, in addition to the me memento to the moderator, we will also present mementos to some of the panelists who happen to be sponsors. Uh, Mr. Ranganathan. <coughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <coughs> Next, uh, Mr. Madhu Nair, please. He is a sponsor also. And uh, painting, painting. Next, Mr. Biju George, please. He is also a sponsor.
नेक्स्ट डॉक्टर सौहाद सिंह वॉज ऑल्सो स्पॉन्सर नेक्स्ट कमांडर डॉक्टर मोती एंड फाइनली मिस्टर कौस्तुभ फालनेकर 